I'm a big believer in facing the truth. I would rather be hurt by the truth and blamed by bullshit. I've always been that way. And I had an NT wife email me today. Says, well, you know, you could use neurodiverse instead of autism spectrum disorder because, you know, so these guys are sensitive. And I think that, they, you know, my husband is real sensitive and he, he doesn't want to, you know, admit that he has, might have this disorder. And um, so you've heard of this term, right? Neurodiverse. And, it, you know, it's, it's a politically correct term and it would, you know, be a little more sensitive. So um, duly noted, but um, I don't think you guys are that fragile that I have to be, I, I'm not really into being politically correct. Um, plus I use neurodiversity to describe the couples. When I say neurodiverse couples, I mean one has autism, one does not. So the reason I'm not willing to use neurodiverse for you guys is because um, there's no shame involved. To use neurodiverse to kind of sugarcoat it a little bit implies that there's something to be ashamed of. No. Period. ASD level one is what we're referring to now. There's two other levels. It has to do with levels of functioning. You're already aware of that. You guys are all ASD level one, which is high functioning. Um, so think of ASD level one as simply a, I don't like the term disorder though, I will tell you that. Because there again, that sounds like there's something wrong or bad or to be ashamed of. So I do not like the term disorder. So I guess I do want to be politically correct on that. I prefer to call it a condition or a different way of thinking because I think that's more in alignment with the reality of things. And you could think of it as a condition of social skills um, being low, social needs being low, logic being high. And that's kind of your saving grace. That is your strength, your logic. We wouldn't have this computer we're talking on right now if we didn't have somebody on the autism spectrum, Asperger's syndrome in, in, back in that day, Bill Gates. The engineering field is full of people on the spectrum. Computer sciences, they're all over the place. It's almost a stretch to call you guys in the minority because there's so many undiagnosed people crawling around all over the planet. If, the, if, if we could get to the bottom of things, we might find that 30% or 40% of people, the entire people on the planet are on the spectrum. That sounds like a bizarre exaggeration. It's not because there's a lot of people that have these traits, but nobody has put two and two together yet and or done some research and thought, ha, hey, maybe you have this thing called ASD level one. They just, they don't, they just go on with life and they don't even entertain the idea. So there's more people that have it than have been diagnosed with it or that even have talked about it. Hey guys, this is Mark with adultaspergerschat.com. And today I got a message for spouses and partners on the autism spectrum. If you are so self-absorbed, to use a sarcastic term, in your special interest or your work, then your NT spouse feels like she's just getting crumbs from you. In other words, so little quality and quantity time that it's just next to nothing. In fact, I hear from NT wives all the time. They even use the term crumbs and uh, they get to the point where they're so emotionally deprived that they would actually settle for some crumbs. Some of them aren't even getting crumbs. So we have 168 hours in a week, right? So if you're only spending two hours of quality time with your NT spouse, that's only 1.19%. You know, if you had a bag of potato chips and your wife came up to you wanting some potato chips, you wouldn't just hand her one potato chip and say, there you go. And then you leave and go into the other room and leave her there with her one potato chip. That's just enough to whet her appetite for more. So when you come along once in a blue moon and give her a five second one arm hug, it's just enough to tease her, but not enough to satisfy her. So NT spouses are often left wanting more 
more quality time, more quantity time, they feel like they're on the back burner, that on the ASD spouse's list of priorities, she's at the bottom. So the moral to this story is don't be so stingy with your time. It doesn't take much effort on your part, virtually no money. She wants to spend time with you. She wants you to be present. Put your digital devices down, shut your computer off, perhaps even turn the TV off and just be with her. Sitting there in the same room with her on the other end of the couch while you're looking at your iPhone is not quality time. She wants give and take in conversation. She wants to share what's going on in her life. She wants to get a little bit of moral support, physical affection and emotional reciprocity from you. That is quality time. That is sharing half of the bag of the potato chips with her. So the general philosophy of people on the autism spectrum, and this is very generalized by the way, is based in the belief system that people are largely just in the way of me completing tasks. People are mostly an impediment to me engaging in my special interest. People are mostly obstacles to me engaging in my self-soothing anxiety reduction activities. So based on that belief system, the inner dialogue or self-talk is usually along the lines of, I must be able to engage in my special interest as often as possible for anxiety reduction reasons. I need to be distracted with something pleasurable to escape the anxieties experienced in the real world. And I need to engage in activities that alleviate boredom because most things outside of my special interest are painfully boring. So based on that self-talk, the emotion that's evoked is often one of frustration. In fact, it is exceedingly common, in fact, we will say 100% of the time, for people on the autism spectrum to have low frustration tolerance. Feelings of frustration are largely due to people getting in the way of completing tasks, disrupting their routine and structure, and imposing change on them, unwanted change. When this happens, the feelings of frustration can then graduate to anger or anxiety overload, the first of which may manifest in the form of a meltdown or tantrum, the second of which may result in a shutdown. So based on that particular belief system and the associated self-talk and the associated feelings of frustration and anger, behaviorally, the individual will appear rigid, self-absorbed, disconnected from relationships and preoccupied with things. In other words, tasks, objects, facts, figures, and so on. So what I run into a lot is the situation where the man in this case, we'll use the ASD man and the NT wife as the example. He is literally afraid of his NT wife at this point when the conflict has gone on for years unresolved. And uh, this usually starts out by she, the NT wife, has not experienced the degree of emotional reciprocity that she wants and needs and desires. A lot of her expectations are not being met. This goes on for quite a few years with uh, good intention. She tries to reconcile differences, trying to make the relationship work, trying to fix some broken pieces and her good faith effort usually downloads in his mind, the ASD man, as complaining, criticism, being parental, constantly correcting him. And so now he feels like he's on thin ice all the time, like he's in the doghouse much of the week. And I have heard so many self reports from these men that they honestly are afraid to say much or do much because they just assume that they're going to get in trouble. And so they tend to basically go into shy mode. And uh, this could look like uh, he's spending less time with you. He doesn't really want to engage conversation with you. He may view you as his major source of anxiety. He tends to be preoccupied with other things. And that downloads in the NT wife's mind as he doesn't care about the relationship. I'm not important to him and so on. But in many cases, what's really going on, he is just trying to avoid drama and conflict and arguments. He doesn't feel like he can win. And at some level, he's given up hope because he's, in his mind anyway, he has tried numerous things, none of which seem to help anything. And these men will say this a lot. It doesn't matter what I say or do, it's never good enough. And they are literally afraid and I'm not exaggerating, they are con constantly overly concerned for good reason in their mind that it's better to say nothing at this point because when I try to fix it, oftentimes it makes a bad problem worse. And um, they're basically in a form of flight. 
And you may notice as an NT wife that sometimes he flips to the other side of that spectrum and goes into fight, which would be the meltdown, adult temper tantrum, and so on, and then flips back to the shutdown. So the moral to the story then is we need to come up with a communication strategy such that the NT wife can get her point across. In this case, the point being I need to get some of my needs met without that downloading in his brain as I'm being attacked yet again. And so I really need to protect myself and how I protect myself is to disconnect. So I have an exercise for both the NT spouse and the ASD spouse and this assignment, and it would be good if you could journal or write a paragraph or two about this, would be to look at what's going on uh, underneath the arguments. So we argue with one another because we are angry with what's going on. We feel that there's some unfairness, that some things are just not right. We want to fix it. And so we get angry. Both the NT and the ASD individual get angry. So that's what's underneath the argument is anger. But what's underneath the anger is fear. And that's what I would like for you to look at in journal. So the question then becomes, when you argue with your spouse, what is the fear that's motivating that argument? Is it fear of not getting your needs met? Fear of loss? Fear of being chastised, ridiculed, criticized, put down, disrespected, and so on. So we don't argue for no good reason. You spend a lot of time and energy arguing. In fact, if you've had a knockdown drag out argument that has lasted for an hour or more, you may have realized that you're exhausted because it does burn up a lot of energy. And so if you could look at the fear that's motivating these arguments, that's motivating the anger, then the next step then would be, okay, what can I do to address the fear? Because my arguing isn't addressing my fear one bit. It's actually increasing my anger because we never get anything resolved, which in turn is increasing my fear, which means the next time we argue about the same damn thing, it's even going to be more intense than the previous time. So that's the assignment, guys and ladies. I want you to begin the process of debriefing or going back and investigating your arguments in retrospect after they have already happened. You wouldn't necessarily have to do this as a couple. It would be probably better to do it individually. And go back and replay that argument that happened earlier today or yesterday or last week and do a little investigation, examine why was I so invested in defending myself or arguing or pouring out all of these angry words that I threw at the other person. What was the fear motivating that? So the next part of the assignment would be then when you have your list of fears, go back and look at, you know, what can I do to get these fears addressed? We'll use the example that may be uh, consistent with what some NT wives experience. We'll go with the fear of not getting my emotional needs met. So the next time you would have the propensity to argue and fight and get angry, instead maybe you could actually have a conversation rather than an argument about how I can get my emotional needs met. So you'd want to brainstorm some ideas about that and then you could present that in a calm manner to your spouse. Let's use an example for uh, the man who has autism spectrum disorder and maybe one of his fears is being criticized. So now you would need to brainstorm some ways that you could converse with your NT wife such that her words didn't download as criticism in your brain. So the hope then is that you could actually have a conversation rather than an argument and give your NT wife some ideas on how she can express herself such that you don't view that as put downs, criticism, her being parental, exaggeratory, and so on. So this is not a magic bullet, but it's certainly the beginning of looking at the core issue, which is your fears. If you want more details on how to do this and go uh, deeper into this exercise, then by all means, email me and we can elaborate and broaden this exercise in a more thorough manner and do a uh, deeper investigation into what's going on underneath the anger. Mark, I have a question and I'm okay with you adding my voice message and your answer to a public YouTube video. My question is, what's the best way for people with Asperger's to manage their anxiety? Thank you, Ken. Well, in answer to the question, uh, there's not gonna be a one size fits all. 
or a cookie cutter approach for anxiety because what causes your anxiety might not cause anxiety for somebody else and what alleviates your anxiety might not alleviate that anxiety in somebody else. So it's going to be a very individual approach to find out what works best for you. But let's make a distinction between fear and anxiety because fear is something that you're afraid of, but you know exactly what it is. For example, let's say you hate going to the dentist and you've got to go to the dentist next week and you know you're going to sit there and get a cavity worked on and you kind of predict what's going to go on. You already know because you've been there and done it before. So yes, there's some apprehension there, but you know what's going to happen. Anxiety, though, is being afraid of something and you don't know what it is. You just know that you feel anxious and the anxiety that's going on in the moment is not the event itself because you don't even know what the event is. It's your self-talk. So we have to look at self-talk. So if the event actually manifests itself in your life, the one that you've been worrying about so much, that e actual event will be way less emotionally painful than the worrying about that event prior to the actual occurrence. The actual event is not the source of your anxiety. It's the thinking about the event that is the source of your anxiety. Think of it like this. Let's say you're in college. You've got a big exam coming up. Maybe it's the final and it's super important that you get a good grade on this. And maybe you have some test anxiety. And so you engage in this if then business. If I freeze up, then I might flunk this test or if it's harder than I think and if I didn't study enough for this test, I may get a bad grade. And if I don't pass this exam, I may flunk the course. And if I flunk the course, I may have to take it again. And if I have to take the course again, then it's going to take longer for me to get my degree. And if it takes longer for me to get my degree, it's going to cost me more money. And if my parents are helping me financially, they may get upset with me for taking longer than expected. And so you get in this if then loop, a bunch of what ifs, and that is the anxiety. Another example is there was a lady who had IBS symptoms and it triggered her anxiety. And so her commute was particularly stressful. So she gets up and she starts having some stomach issues. And then she starts getting sucked into this if then loop if I have stomach troubles this morning, then I'm going to have anxiety on the way to work. And if I have anxiety on the way to work, then I'm going to have to stop at a gas station somewhere on an emergency basis. And if I do that, then I'm going to be late for work. And if I'm late for work, then I'm going to get a point. And if I get too many points, I'm going to get fired. And so you're down in this rabbit hole of what ifs. There again, that is the anxiety, not so much the drive to work in and of itself. So you get the point, right? The anxiety is the what if business. It is the if then loop that you get sucked into. So what we can do in that case is we can look for triggers to our anxiety and maybe even journal those. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a notebook. It could be one piece of paper. And so after you have an anxiety provoking event and you're calm, you could write down, okay, what happened right before I got anxious? That is the trigger. And then you would also want to write down what was my self-talk during this anxiety provoking event. So let's use an example of an husband on the autism spectrum and his neurotypical wife is upset about something. And so she is uh, asking a lot of questions. You know, maybe she's saying things like, why can't you ever blah, 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 blah. Or why do you always do such and such? Or what were you thinking when you didn't follow through with blah, blah, blah. And so she's upset and she's kind of interrogating. And so that is the anxiety provoking event. And then maybe your self-talk was, oh my God, here we go again, complain, complain, complain. I'm always in trouble. I didn't do anything wrong. Why is she treating me like a child? I feel so criticized. I have to defend myself. I have to prove that she is wrong, etc. So in this example, her complaints about the relationship not going right did download as a trigger for you, but it was the self-talk that exacerbated the anxiety. So what do we want to do? We want to begin the business of practicing different self-talk. So using the example that I just illustrated where she is upset and she's kind of quizzing you, you know, why can't you do this? Why do you always do that? Because she's frustrated and at her wits end and you're downloading that as nothing but criticism and put downs and shaming and blaming. So what 
could you do differently next time in the way of self-talk? Here's some ideas. I could realize that she's quizzing me because the relationship is really important to her. Another thought could be, I'll stay and listen and then I'll paraphrase back what I heard so I can understand her point. In other words, I'm going to listen to understand rather than listen to mount a defense. Another thought could be, I'll ask what I can do to help rather than just do some version of shutdown or meltdown. So we want to replace the negative self-talk that sets us up for the if-then loop with more positive, constructive, and realistic inner dialogue that is more representative of what might actually be going on. So in summary, the best anxiety reduction strategy for you will be for you to identify what types of self-talk you engage in when you're in the throes of a particular anxiety producing event. And each event will trigger different self-talk. You wanna look at those and you wanna begin the process of coming up with some deliberate replacements for the negative self-talk. So that's the key term, deliberate. You will have to start thinking deliberately when you're in the middle of the storm. In the early going, the NT wife, who is not the wife yet, meets this guy, he's a little quirky, um, and naive and maybe even shy and forgetful. And she, she finds some of these traits a little cute in the beginning. And um, she may be at an unconscious level think, well, this guy kind of needs me <laughs> to take, he seems a little helpless. And she being the motherly person that you are, or we're gonna be, you thought, well, I, you know, this is kind of cute. You may or may not resonate with that, but I see that a lot. And also in the early going, um, if you don't know he has ASD, and maybe he doesn't even know it. And by the way, when I say ASD, I'm saying high-functioning autism, Asperger's syndrome, ASD level one, you know, whatever, whatever we're calling it now. AK, the UK still calls it Asperger's. Most of the rest of the world calls it um, ASD level one. Level two being moderate needs moderate support. Level three being needs major support. ASD level three is full-blown autistic disorder. So we're talking ASD level one here. And so you may not have known that he had it, and he may not have even known that he had it, but he probably knew that he had some odd mannerisms and he probably camouflaged very well in the early going because he was uncomfortable with you still. But then when he got comfortable, uh, he kind of let down his guard and didn't mind just being his true self. And then you got to see the full meal deal and you got to see some of the behaviors that may have been troubling to you way back in the day, early, in the early going even. And so in the early part of the relationship, um, in the early going also, he camouflages some of his behavior that he's already known from childhood was kind of problematic. And so he's wanting to present very well. And so, he probably passed as a fairly typical person in the very beginning. But like I say, the more comfortable he got with you, the more he let down his camouflaging behavior and the more you saw the true person coming out. In the very beginning, he what you were his special interest. As you probably have researched, they have one, maybe two, usually just one special interest that they spend most of their time with. And it usually doesn't have anything to do with people. It's usually a task. Uh, that they're more into objects and things and tasks and not so much into social stuff. And so, but in the very beginning, you were his special interest. But as the relationship grew, there were more and more responsibilities. I'm just going to make examples up. Maybe you wanted him to go see your parents and he's not very socially, probably didn't like that. Then there, there was the pressure to get married and he may have gone along with that, but felt a lot of internal anxiety that didn't reveal and then the kids come along so anyway, long story short the more the relationship progresses the more messy it got for him the more complex it got for him and so with this additional complexity over the years this raised his anxiety significantly and you may have noticed that as the years rolled by in the marriage he got more and more distant from you and more and more connected to his his special interest, which was his anxiety reduction strategy. And so now here we sit today, and you guys are going, he, I'm, not, I'm not important to him. Um, his uh, hobby is more important than I am. I can't get him to connect, then talk about feelings. Uh, whenever we try to discuss a problem, he downloads it as criticism. 
and feels like you know, he's being attacked and yada, yada, yada. And so here we are today with you guys, uh, and I'm not complaining, um, who wouldn't perceive that as rejection? But what's really going on in most of these cases where you're downloading it as rejection and withdrawal from the relationship is really more, has more to do with his anxiety reduction strategy. So one of the, there are several traits. I'm going to mention some traits that get in the way uh, of the relationship that cause a problem. With, with people on the autism spectrum, they turn their emotions way down, not off, but way down. And a lot of NT wives say, well, uh, he doesn't have any empathy. No, he has empathy, but he has, he lacks displayed empathy. He has it somewhere in there, he, he just doesn't reveal it. And they also have what I call selective empathy. They can be highly empathic in certain situations, and it appears like they have no empathy in other situations. And I even have experienced numerous times although you may be astonished with this, where he had so much empathy that it was so painful and stressful to feel that he shut it off. Um, that's usually a childhood issue thing where he did have empathy, but his, his empathic uh, ability was so strong that it was just too painful to have empathy, and he literally had to manually shut it off, so to speak. So... They turn their emotions way down, and that, this comes from many years of, honestly, emotions getting in the way of their logical way of thinking. So it's not that they don't have room for emotions. They, they just don't see any need for emotions in their mind. Emotions, as far as they're concerned, get in the way of completing tasks. In fact, you could even think uh, their motto might be remove the emotions and accomplish the task more efficiently. They are very task-oriented. And so... ASD is a developmental disorder, and developmentally, their social emotional brain is stunted. So their social skills are lacking, their displayed empathy is exceedingly low, but honestly, it's even a little more problematic than that because their logical brain is over-functioning. And a highly logical brain is an overthinking brain. It gets stuck on details. He gets hooked into a thought he can't see the big picture. He can't put the details together. Like if he's making plans that involve several steps, he'll get stuck on one step and he has a hard time moving into the rest of the steps. And so uh, he ends up procrastinating a lot because he's on the OCD side that comes with the territory. Very perfectionistic. If he doesn't get all his ducks in a row for step one, he's not moving on to step two. So we have two problems here. We have a low social emotional brain that's stunted. So emotionally, socially, you may have a 35 year old, 45 year old husband, for example. Chronologically, socially and emotionally, he's more like a 14 year old. And then you have this overly logical brain that's getting in the way of seeing the big picture. And now we contrast that with you with this very highly intelligent social emotional, emotional brain. So now you're high in social emotional intelligence. He's low. So you can kind of see why there is, I mean, how could you not have problems in that case? You can imagine. So the other thing that goes on with people with ASD is they have this mind blindness stuff, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. So if I have mind blindness, I have a hard time guessing what is in the mind of my wife I have a hard time knowing what she might be thinking, what she might be feeling based on what she's thinking, why she's behaving a certain way based on how she's feeling, what her motives are. I don't understand her opinions. And so I'm drawing blanks trying to figure her out. She's a very complex and confusing and a mystery to me. And so with this mind blindness issue, I have to fill in the blanks with something. But unfortunately, with, with mind blindness, since I'm not really sure what's going on with the other person, I tend to fill in that blank with my own poor assessment, which almost always has a negative spin. So 
he is misinterp not only misinterpreting your behavior in most cases and your and your feelings and your opinions and your perspective he's not only misinterpreting that he's in many cases putting a negative spin on it he's going to have a hard time understanding and predicting the consequences of his behavior and since he is highly logical and low in the emotional business he's going to view you as overly emotional illogical irrational and so on so they have they have hard time uh talking about i'm sure you've run into this talking about the relationship problems because they view that as uh, an attack they have a hard time listening to negative emotions expressed by you because whenever they hear a difference of opinion or an attempt to explain a different perspective about a situation they view that as conflict and criticism and also as you probably have surmised routines are paramount with this mind blindness business since i'm not really sure what other people might be thinking why they're feeling certain ways why they're behaving certain ways my life is highly unpredictable in the social sense and since i have all this unpredictability what i have to do to keep my stress as low as possible so i don't lose my mind is i have to have as much routine and structure as possible and i hate change if this is the case with me if i have mind blindness i'm going to hate change because it's a surprise and i hate surprises so routines are paramount they find great difficulty in changes in their routine uh, they don't like surprises and the last thing as far as uh, traits that get in the way of the relationship is and i mentioned this earlier tasks they're very task oriented so their motto could be tasks first relationships second so you, you can see when you take all that into combination uh, as, as a combined figure, everything that I just said, it shouldn't be any surprise to you why there is such a disconnect. And to make matters even worse, your method, most of you out of well-intentioned heart in your effort to try to get him to reconnect because you care about the relationship. You, you don't want it to go down the toilet. So you've worked very hard to try to get him to wake up and to be a part of the family, to be a team player. But almost in all cases, well, I'm just going to go ahead and say in all cases, I, to date, in my experience, her message gets lost because her approach causes anxiety in him. Her message gets lost because her approach has raised his anxiety and he either melts down or shuts down or pretends like he's listening, but he's off in his fantasy world and didn't ever hear a damn thing. It didn't go in one ear and out the other. It didn't even go in the one ear. So if you have found that, well, I can't even talk to him about anything. I could make a neutral comment and he feels attacked. Then he has assigned you as a major source of stress for him. In fact, in too many cases, and it's sad to say, she has become his number one source of anxiety. And then you can imagine what happens then with you. Now you have no emotional reciprocity. You don't feel like you're appreciated at all. You may even, if he tends to be more meltdownish than shutdownish, you've probably been verbally abused. And some women even have been traumatized, quite honestly. So when you have tried to talk to your husband on the autism spectrum, about uh, relationship issues, have you found that he just viewed you as being critical and putting him down and making him feel like he's to blame for all the problems? It's all his fault. If your husband on the autism spectrum is similar to most of the other men that I work with, he has grown up being told that uh, he's not uh, behaving properly and that he is uh, he has been disapproved of numerous times by parents, teachers, and even peers. So he grew up knowing that uh, he wasn't quite meeting others' expectations. And as a result, he now as an adult is very hypersensitive to perceived criticism. I say perceived criticism because oftentimes people are not purposely being critical, but he perceives it as such. And even constructive criticism or neutral feedback can download as criticism to him today because he has been conditioned, and that's the magic word, 
he has been conditioned from childhood to uh, receive any type of feedback and view it as criticism. So now you, the NT wife, come along in his life and he is perhaps not being emotionally reciprocal or displaying intimacy and empathy in the way that you want. And so you, being the loving, caring person that you are and valuing the marriage like you do, you want to fix the relationship and you approach him in a way and guess what? Your message downloads to him as yet another parental reprimand. He views you as a parent who is yet again disapproving of his behavior and he's going to accuse you of blaming him, of being critical of him and making him to believe that he's not good enough. So by virtue of a lifetime of voiced disapproval from others, he is literally programmed to perceive criticism. When you begin the sentence like we need to talk or I have some an issue that I need to discuss with you, he instantly predicts that he will be criticized. He expects it, he looks for it, and as you're talking, he's mounting a defense. He's not listening to what you have to say. And then after dozens and dozens and dozens of failed attempts on your part to get him to understand your perspective, your feelings, and so on, you know that it's not likely you're going to get anywhere with him. You know that uh, when you voice your hurts and anger, he's going to do a version of meltdown or shutdown or just adult temper tantrum, and you're not going to get anywhere in the way of conflict resolution or problem solving. And so you walk away from that argument disappointed yet again and after this happens for several years you are now conditioned for disappointment in other words you go into a discussion already predicting that it's not going to turn out very well so now we fast forward years into the relationship he's conditioned for criticism you're conditioned for disappointment and the problems go unresolved and just pile up in the closet so you're dealing with a man who has super low self-esteem is hypersensitive to criticism and will view even some of your neutral comments as criticism. So what do we do with this situation? Wordage is super important. It's important for you to word things in a way that doesn't convey disapproval 